All right. Welcome. <laughs> all right. I think you all know where I'm going to be going. I'm taking you to this new frequency level to really heal. When I'm talking about healing, I'm not just talking about the physical. That's the first thing that comes to your mind because your body's in pain, right? But emotionally, the pain is greater, and spiritually, the pain is the greatest. If you're out of whack spiritually, nothing else is going to vibrate with it at all. All disease is spiritual based. All disease. So if nothing else today, I'm working that spiritual healing level. You will all leave here today with a higher frequency rate. How long you retain that, how much work you do to keep it going and to build it and go past that point, totally in your control. Just like the healing I name this self-healing workshop, meaning Reverend Bill is not going to heal anybody. The healer is within you. The guru is within you. God is in with you. Look in the mirror. That's your Savior. And I'm going to teach you today about the importance of self-love. You know, what's that got to do with healing? I asked that same question when I was 18 years old. I was living and surfing on the, on the island of Oahu back in 1964, and I met a kahuna priest, David K. Bray. I mean, the guy. The guy was just amazing. And he was 60-some years old, and I was 18, and he made me a apprentice. And he goes, first thing I'm going to do is teach you about healing. I said, okay, well, I got to know, because I was getting ready to surf, and you know, I got my board ready to go. He says, no, no. First thing on healing, you want to heal somebody, first thing you got to do is love yourself. And I'm going, what has this old man been smoking? I mean, what, love yourself and I'm going to heal people? You know, he says, and, and you got to forgive yourself. This is before all this ono, pono, pono, bono, mono stuff that everybody's reading about now in all the books. It's all everybody knows about love and forgiveness and gratitude. But back in 1964, this was really kahuna culture. It was just the Hawaiian culture. And I listened to that at the time thinking, yeah, okay, fine, that's not what I'm going to do. Not. As I got older, I don't know if I got wiser, but as I got older, I saw the value in what he was saying I had to live a little longer. But if you don't love yourself, you can't give anybody else love. If you don't love yourself, you can't give anybody else forgiveness. You can't give anybody else a gift of whatever you have to give. It's all shallow. And I say that because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I won't mention any names or states or nothing, but I had a woman come to me a couple weeks ago and uh, she goes, Reverend Bill sends me a note. Reverend Bill, uh, you, you got to help me. Give me a private session. I, I don't care if you charge me. I said, I don't usually charge. You know, I don't charge people for advice. She goes, no, no. no, 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 no. I said, okay. So I looked at her website, and she was a psychiatrist charging about almost $200 an hour for her advice, right? And I'm thinking, well, hell, she's charging 200 bucks. She's asking for my advice. I told her, I said, donate whatever you think my time's worth, right? So she gets on there and she tells me she's never been happy. She's always been depressed. 20 years she's been suicidal. She's been in the darkness. And yet, for the last 20 years, she's got this website saying, be the divine princess. Be the divine mother spirit. God loves you and he's in you and joy and peace and all that stuff. And yet she's coming to me and telling me her entire life she's never been happy, ever. How could she help anybody really go any farther than she's gone? Oh, bottom line on that, I gave her, I gave her an hour and plus, and she goes, Rabbi, that's the best advice I ever had. I took notes, I recorded, I'm going to use that for my own counseling. 
I said, okay. She sent me a donation, $34.50. I'm going, okay, that was what it was worth to her, to the best advice she ever got in her life. I said, okay. But there are people out there that are taking you to places that they're at. They're not taking you up the mountaintop. They've been to the base camp. So if you go with them, because you think you're going to go to Mount Everest, you're going to go as far as they've been, the base camp. That's why I tell people, don't go looking outside yourself. There's a lot of wisdom in there. There's also some delusion. Because I, I talk to a lot of people, they all think they're practically gurus. They all think, this is my last, if I get one more person, this is my last lifetime, I'm out of here. And, <laughs> and, and, and now, that, now that I'm enlightened, and before I was enlightened, and I'm going, really? Okay, that included this lady I was giving advice to. Yeah, before I was enlightened, but I realize now that I'm enlightened that I'm depressed and suicidal. All right, so you see that, but unfortunately the people that are in those states don't see it. They don't see it. So why am I telling you this? Why am I starting at this place to talk about healing? Because at this place, we need to heal that inner child. We need to heal that broken heart. We need to heal that broken marriage. We need to heal that broken soul. We need to heal our understanding of ourselves. We need to forgive ourselves because we're human. There's only one in this universe. There's only one in creation. What does that mean, Reverend Bill? It's only one. There's only one. There's just one. The creator. Love. Love creates everything. It's all from love. It, it is love. You can call it God, Jesus, doesn't matter, Buddha, it doesn't matter. There's only one. It's just the, there's just one of us. So when I got people ask me, Reverend Bill, why do you go out and you leave your wife and, and you travel all, literally around the world and you're gone from home and you, you, you beat yourself up on the road and you, you, know, and you do all these things you eat, and you go out and you eat all this food and come back heavier. And, anyway, another story. Um, why? What's in it for you? It's not what's in it for me. It's what's in it for, for us. Because I don't separate myself from you. A lot of people do. They separate themselves from God. How do they separate themselves from God? Think about this. I'm going to pray to God, meaning God is out there someplace or up there. Or... If you are God, there's nothing else. There's no not God. Everything is God. <clears throat> You don't have to go talking to or traveling to. God is within. Seek first the kingdom of God. It's within. Right? Kingdom of God is within. What does that mean? And if you don't love yourself, and I just said you're one with the divine, with the creator, there's no difference. And if you don't love you, then you really don't love God. And if you don't love God and everybody else is God, then you don't love anybody else. And you wonder why you're ill. And you wonder why you're sick. And you wonder why you're depressed. It is so bad, there's not a day goes by where I'm not counseling some person, a lot of women lately, but a lot of women in spirit. Apparently this last five years, I don't know why, but this last five years, women have been feeling more stressed than I've ever seen it in the last 40, 50 years of my counseling. It's now that it's catching up with women. Maybe it's because now they feel they got the rights to do everything, but they're getting beat up in the process. Something's going on. I don't know what it is. But there's a lot of unhappy people out there. They're not satisfied with putting up with a bad relationship. They're not satisfied not being successful. They're not satisfied with being themselves anymore. They want to change. Change is good. Change is exactly what everybody should be doing. Let's put it this way. Let's talk about change. How many people here from high school? How many people here still have all their friends are from their high school class? Okay. How many people here are all their friends from their college class? A couple. All their friends. How many people here got the same friends they had 20 years ago? I mean, the majority of them. How about 10 years ago? Have you changed friends? How about five years ago? Do you notice that as you go through things, without fighting people, saying, I don't want to be with you anymore, I, you know, 
it's, it's natural, just as you change your vibration, others are not, or changing differently. So they're not bad guys, they're just changing. And that's why you wonder why there's 45% of Americans are divorced. Because when you got married at 18, 20, 25, 30, whatever, you weren't the same people 15 years later. Think about that for a minute. You're, you've changed from that youthful person. You don't even believe the same anymore. I mean, I won't ask for hands on this, but most of you have gone through several different religious beliefs in your lifetime. Okay? It's rare when I say, no, I've been this all my life. It's rare. Not good, not bad. I'm just saying you're still evolving. And the truths and things that you believe before you walked in here or even right now, they may be altered or changed tomorrow, tomorrow, or tomorrow. I see Bill smiling back there. He's trying to end the line there. <laughs> so I'm asking you during this workshop, I call it a workshop. This is more of me pressing your hearts and souls, trying to change the energy. I'm going to work my butt off. All you have to do, all I'm asking for you to do is just open your heart Forget about the minds. Forget about analyzing anything that I've said. It's not important. It's words. And if all you're changing and all your spiritual evolutionary path is words, reading books, listening to YouTube videos, you know, all that kind of stuff, if, if that's the bulk of your work, then you're missing something. You're still inside the head. That's not where the changes are going to come. I want to get you to a point where thoughts and thinking and reasoning and, and analyzing is just going to kind of fade into the background today. That's where I want to take you. So what are you going to do, bore us to death? You know, somebody, no. But I will tell you some stories because in telling stories, I found that even in biblical times, all the, good, all the good tales, it's always a story, right? The good Samaritan story, you know, you know the, the, the tree with the good seed and the bad seed. All, everybody likes a story. I tell my own stories. I don't tell anybody else's stories because I can trust that what I'm telling you is what my experience was. And I share these stories with you not to impress you and say, oh, that's a really neat story. Great, he's Irish, he's got a thousand stories. No, I tell you the stories because I'm trying to change your heart frequency. So I'll pick ones. And some of the stories I'm going to tell you today you say, what per tell is that story got to do with anything we're talking about? Logically, probably nothing. But I'm telling you there's a deeper subtext here because I'm telling you for the energy value of what I'm telling you. So listen, listen with the heart. Don't try to analyze it. What's, what's the deal with this story? And I, and I say that because, for example, I was giving this lecture in Elk Grove, California, at a church. I rented a church building. I do this. I go into town and I just rent a church. Whoever shows up, shows up. And it was a rainy, rainy day. I mean, it was the most rain I've ever seen in California. It must have rained at least two inches. Most rain I've ever seen. It was just like unbelievable, right? There was puddles out there. I mean, you know, in California, but oh my God, I can't go. It's raining. Somebody heard about my program at the senior assisted living place. And, you know, the people there are always looking for something for the old people to do. And somebody found the thing, and they loaded up these buses. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting here, and there's like five, six people. And all of a sudden, I see two buses pull up. And all these guys with walkers and canes, you know, and, you know, and they're all coming out of there. And somebody had a poodle. And I'm going, really? <laughs> and, they, and, they, and they filled up the church, right? And I thought, okay. It was a week before Christmas. I thought, they need it. Who needs this more than anybody? The only thing bad about it was I found out that I was actually one of the oldest people in the room. <laughs> so in case you want, I'm 77. Okay? Just, just want the record to show it. I don't want to fool anybody. And uh, so this lady was sitting there the whole time just with her arms folded, sitting in the back row listening and listening and listening. 
And finally, we had a break, came back. And when we get a break, you'll notice that when we have a break, you come back, I'll tell some stupid story. That gives people a chance to settle down, and, and then we get ready to go again. So I said, you know, I'll tell her the story about rafting down the Sacramento River. Sacramento River and the American River run through Sacramento. And I'm rafting, actually I'm rafting on the American River going towards the Sacramento River. And I hadn't been on that river in five, ten years. It was on my, trust me, I, I sunburn. I don't like to be on a raft. So I'm on this raft. Wasn't supposed to be on it, but I'm there. I get off at the beach. And I'm looking down the beach, and I see a whole group of young people pulling a body out of this frigid, ice-cold water coming down from the Sierra Nevadas, you know, coming down from Lake Tahoe and everything's really frozen. It's really cold, like melted water. And, uh, and I run down the end of the beach being a former lifeguard, and, I, and they got this body laying on these rocks, gravel. It's a 17-year-old boy, ashen white, no heartbeat, no pulse. I asked the people, how long has he been under? They go, we don't know, but we've been looking for him for nine minutes. So it could have been 10 minutes before that or whatever. And then they just let him lay there. And I said, get out of the way. So I'm mad. I'm going, all these young people just standing there letting their friend die. This is the story I'm telling that woman. And so I pushed everybody aside. I went through the whole life garbage. Remember that mouth-to-mouth -mouth stuff you were taught or some of you were taught? It still works. Right? So even though there's COVID and there's AIDS and there's all that stuff. Anyway, so I'm working this. The whole time I'm resentful to these young people thinking, what's going on? So finally he erupts, you know, because when you, anybody here ever do lifeguard work, you, when you bring somebody around, they, they vomit. That's enough said. All right. So I'm there and I clean everything up. And he stands up. After being unconscious, I don't know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. I was taught that you don't stop artificial respiration until a paramedic, the fire department, police officer, or medical person relieves you. And people kept saying, hey, mister, he's dead. He's dead. I mean, come on, you know, come on. This is... And I just kept going and going and going and going and going and going. That's my training. So he finally stands up, and I look, and there's this beautiful, atypical, and I don't want to sound stereotyping here, but atypical, beautiful, young, 16-year-old blonde girl. Looked like she belonged on the beach, you know, and with a surfboard. I mean, she was just the typical happy-go-lucky. And she's standing there, and she's looking at me, and, and I'm mad. Her and her friends, right? And I go, what's wrong with you people? I said, your friend is laying here, and you're not doing anything to help him. And she goes, oh, no, mister. We were doing something. I go, doing what? She says, we were praying to Jesus that he would send somebody to know how to help our friend and save him. And I go, what? <laughs> what? She says, and you came, didn't you? So I look up the parking lot and there was this bus. First Baptist Church of San Jose, wherever they're at. Thank you. But it was like I was humbled. So that's the story I'm telling to this group of old people. And then I look over at her. There's tears just streaking down her face. I thought, well, that was a neat story, but not that great. I mean, you know, come on, I got better. So when the whole program was over, she came up to me and, and hugged me. She says, I was sitting around today. It's a week before Christmas, and I was feeling all alone, and I missed my son who died when he was 17. He drowned, and nobody saved him. And I thought, my, my world's terrible, and I have nothing to do today, and I was just feeling yucky. And then when they told me about coming to this, I had an inspiration. Well, maybe I should go to that. She says, but when you told that story about a 17-year-old boy drowning that you saved, she says, my son talked to my heart, and I knew I was supposed to be there today. And that story you told was for me. Thank you. So when I tell a story, I never analyze the point of this is, I tell you things, there's no filters. Jim, you'll tell, there's no filter in, in, in Reverend Bill. There's no filter. I just say whatever comes up. That's it. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you're telling the truth, and you're always telling the truth, and you're talking from your heart, 
You don't need a script. You don't need to memorize nothing. You just talk to people and say, I love you. And when I tell you as a group that I love you, that's not small talk. I really say that. When I say I love you, I mean I really literally love every single one of you. Some of you, when I get to know you, I mean I like you, but I love you, right? That's what we do as a group. And the fact that you guys are all gathered together here, there's a connective energy between all of you that flows. You know, 10 years from now, whatever it is, this group's energy is still a part of your spiritual DNA. And so I, to go back to the original question, why do I go out and do this? Because I see in each one of you, me. No separation. Of course, if I was tall as him, as good looking as you, I'd be in great business. But anyway, the me I got, here I am. But anyway, it's all you. It's all me. It's all one. There is no separation. So coming into this thing today, I want you to kind of hold that thought that there is no separation. Reverend Bill is not going to heal anybody here today. But you, the healer, if you choose to do that, there's nothing that cannot happen today. I'm only going to recharge your batteries today and teach you a technique. I'm going to provide you a menu. I'm going to provide you water. I didn't invent the water, and, uh, and I, you know, I'm not, I didn't even give you the glass. I'm just bringing you the water. So that's what I'm bringing you for today. So I want you to just take your brains, your thoughts, and just sap them out. So let's talk healing. Mental, physical, spiritual. Because it applies to all of it. There's no difference. Same, same technique. So Reverend Bill, I'm asked all the time, Reverend Bill, what do you, what do you mean healing? What, what are you doing? Well, so first off, let's throw this out. How many people have seen some of the pictures online with my face all torn up and everything? All right, so some of you haven't, but my nose has been cut off three times. I mean, cut off three times. That's my shoulder you're looking at. I just had surgery the 15th of August, and I was in the hospital ER 11 days after that. Only thing I got left is a top hole in the head, which I'm covering up right now because it's, it's healing. But I've had surgeries the last couple of years. I had 15 surgeries, 16 surgeries, 300 plus stitches. And I look, I look so bad. <laughs> I look, I look so bad that when I, I tried to put my, my photo. On uh, Facebook. Last year, I had a warning, warning, warning. You know, uh, that it was graphic. And violent, and they, I was in Facebook jail. So, this is just one of many. But that's just one of my 15 surgeries. They all look like this or worse. And yet, after every surgery, here I am again. So, what does that mean? What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to tell you that I walk my talk. When I tell you what I'm going to teach you, will heal you. I mean that. We're not talking prevention. Whole different thing. Prevention deals with karma, diet, recklessness, you know, run in front of a, there's all kinds of stuff involved. But I'm talking about healing. Healing. So I have had to learn to overcome 12 major heart attacks, open heart surgery, congestive heart failure. Diabetes, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, bad kidneys, Bryce's disease. Name and the list. The list goes on. There's not an organ in my body that doesn't have some kind of problem. Okay? Seriously. And I've been in uh, eight helicopter crashes. I've been in car crashes, motorcycle crashes. Been blown up by a rocket in Vietnam. Been shot by a machine gun. Fallen off the top of my roof twice on a cement sidewalk from the second story. The list goes on. And yet... Like a Timex walks, I'm still ticking, right? <laughs> Why? Because I've actually learned the subtle art of self-healing. I mean, self-healing, loving me didn't stop bullets and you know, stuff. But you know what? 
I healed. And that's all as important to me as we heal because I'm not going to be able to teach you to avoid all these pitfalls in life. You get a disease. You get cancer. You get cerebral palsy. You get Parkinson's disease. You get dementia, all these things. And every one of us in this room knows somebody in that situation. Every one of us knows somebody in that situation. None of us are untouched. And I'm telling you that working on the body, okay, that's good. But working on the spirit, you're going to bring that back. Working on the mind, you're going to bring that back. The body, I don't want to be a spoiler alert here, but none of us are getting out of here alive. Not even you, sir. No one's getting out of here alive. The only one that's ever successfully did that is Elvis. So the rest of us are just mere mortals. <laughs> he died on the cross of glory and celebrity just for us. But anyway, sorry about Elvis. But, um, so that's where we start. How many people here feel, okay, let's just do a little thinking. How many people here feel that today, today, Given the right set of circumstances and what happens here, how many today will feel that there's a, not just a possibility, but at some level they're going to heal themselves of something today? I want to see how many believe. Okay. If you don't believe, I can't do nothing for you. Nothing. I'll guarantee if you're healed. No, I don't believe it. Well, you're right. If you believe you can be healed, you're right. You are the judge and the arbitrator of whether you're healed or not. So people go, well, I went to Reverend Bill and I saw these other people here, but nothing happened to me. I go, I'm sorry, Reverend Bill didn't heal those people, and you certainly didn't heal yourself. It's not me. I'm just here to wake it up in you. I'm here to teach you to fish, not feed you fish every time you get sick. There's a difference. So I'm going to teach you the techniques that I learned in Hawaii as a youth, and then I'm going to teach you techniques I, live, I learned studying yoga, things I learned in the Himalayan mountains, things I learned from Tibetan monks, things I learned from Nath yogis, things I learned in dream states, things I learned in near-death experiences, which I've had three. My goal is to dispense whatever wisdom and knowledge I have when it comes to the spiritual thing, when it comes to loving, forgiving, all, to, to give something of this back to the world before I transpire. Yes, I know. It's, I could live forever, but it's not going to happen. Reality check. I'll be 78 the next birthday, and if I make another 12 years, I'm quite happy. Okay? 90 is a good age. And if I less than that, okay. But I've taken it upon myself over this three-year period, I started last September because I had a dream. I had a dream! Anyway, I had a dream to go out and teach self-healing. Basically, to go out and teach self-love, to teach self-forgiveness, to teach people to appreciate everything they have. That includes cancer. What? What? What, 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 what do you mean? All right. I showed you a picture. My face was... Every five weeks or six weeks, I was having major face stuff done. I mean, it was bad. And I go to the VA. The VA doesn't spend a lot of time and money. In other words, oh, you got, pl no, there's no plastic surgery. They close the holes. Seriously, they close the holes. And then you come back into it and they look at, and then they bring a camera in. Oh, my God, that's better than I thought. That's, I did a better job than I thought I did. That's the last three times there. And they take pictures and they take credit for it and they bring the staff in. Oh, look at this great job we did. No. It's my work. It's your work. They can't produce a scab. They can't get stitches to take. I started working on this when I was young. I was in the hospital for one entire year of my life, between eight and a half and nine and a half years old. Think back when you were that age. Think back, being taken to a hospital and having the doctors tell your parents, we don't think he's going to make it, and your parents turn around, get in the car, and drive away, and they left you at the hospital. 
county hospital. About 10 minutes there and they're all gone. And you get a visitor once, once a week for about 10 minutes for a year. You've never been away from home before. Best thing that ever happened to me. I learned to really love myself because I knew I wasn't getting it out there. But I knew God loved me. I love God. And that's where it started. And I used to lay in bed because that was a year of total bed rest. I couldn't get out of bed and walk around or nothing. And so I started practicing recharging that. How many people know about self-realization fellowship? Paramahansa Yogananda with the lessons. The first, one of the first things about six or seven weeks into the lessons, they teach you a thing called recharging exercises, which everybody looks at and says, oh, these exercises are for Westerners because they can't do yoga. And it's basically calisthenics and tension. And, I, and everybody assumes it's for preparing you for meditation, which it does. But at eight and a half years old, I'm looking at that. And I'm saying, you're creating all this energy inside you. Well, think, take your hands, make a fist, pretend you got 100 pounds of weight, barbell, and try to, you know, and just see that tension you feel. And if you're visualizing energy coming through the top, of your crown chakra, the top of your head, coming down, and you just load that up. That energy's in there. Where's it going to go? So that was my thought process. So when I got out of the hospital, I was out a couple weeks, and I had a dog. I had two dogs, actually, with a small dog, a poodle. It ran out in the street. It got hit by a car going 40 miles an hour, <laughs> splatted it. It's laying on the street. It's got his tongue hanging out off to the side. He's got blood trickling out of the corner, blood coming from the eyes, blood from the ears, blood from the nose, and he's flat, and he's whimpering. And me being nine and a half years old, I go, I go out and I pick him up in my arms. I bring him to the house, and I'm going, I'm going to charge him. I was a thought, I'm going to charge him because I love this animal so much I used the power of love and recharging exercises. So I like tensed up, had love for the animal, pictured the love as energy, love and energy and light coming down and then coming out my fingertips. And when I put my hands on this dog, it was like clear. And the dog jumped up and it was a spark, made like a little sound, crackling sound like static electricity. And he ran around and Lived for many more years. Never went to the never went to the vet. And I thought, let's remember that little trick. That's that's that, okay. Put that in my notebook. All right, that's good. And when I met the Kahuna, I told you where he told me about loving and all that. I took a little while to get there. And then I was traveling in the Himalayas, and I met some people who laid some pretty heavy things on me. I met one guy I spent three days with that didn't speak one word of English. We never exchanged a word. I didn't speak his language. I learned more from that man in three days than I have from any human being since or before. Never exchanged a word. Tibetan refugee. Don't need words. This man just transmitted this. He just demonstrated it, transmitted, and he taught me some techniques. He was teaching me things that I thought I'd made up. When I was in the hospital, I used to imagine uh, breathing through my navel and then bringing the energy up the spine and over and visualizing light and energy and all that stuff. And there's a whole technique involved. That's when I was eight and a half, nine and a half years old. When I was 58 and a half years old, this guy shows me the technique and he does this whole thing and I'm going, wait a minute, I thought I made this up. There really is such a technique. And so there are other ones I've discovered just since then. All right. So we have recharging, getting the energy, focusing. And I'm going to teach you that one because that one applied to helping others, right? You could apply it yourself. You got a bad knee. You got a bad knee. You can do this thing to your own knee. You got, if you got a child, you got an animal, you can use it for them. I don't, I'm not teaching you to go out there and be. Healers of the world, because first off, healing other people, you've got to realize you're taking on a karmic thing, too. You have to have the wisdom to know 
this guy's working off the karma with this illness and you're taking it away, where does it go? There's a lot involved there. But working on yourself or working on your child, working on your own pet, who cares? Work it out with God later. Take care of those people that are close to you. All right. So we're going to combine that. But the most powerful thing, because I'm going to give you some stories how that, that technique works, but the most powerful thing really has been using self-love to heal. So I've had, I don't know, 15, 20 surgeries in the last three years. And uh, every one of them, you know, they cut, they burn, they sew. And it, I know it's not as much fun as it sounds, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> when you leave there, they always want to give you drugs. You're going to need these, kid. <laughs> take these. I go, no, no, no. Don't take any drugs for all these surgeries. I leave, and it's painful, and I go home, and I practice sitting, calming myself down. Pain is going crazy, and I just go, I love me. I love me. Or I'll say, I love you, because it's me. It's, you don't say this out loud because your spouse is going to put you in the nut house. <laughs> People can think, this is weird stuff. You're going, I love me, I love me. No, this is an internal chant. This is an internal thing. I love me. And you forgive yourself. And so I, I went and I said, I, my nose. I mean, my nose got cut off. I said, nose, I love you. Sorry I abused you with all that sunshine in Hawaii and California and, you know, and being a lifeguard and a scuba instructor and swim team and, you know, and all this other stuff. I said, forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done to you. You know, my nose. And cancer, instead of hating the cancer, oh, I hate cancer, F cancer. I see signs of that, and I'm going, that's like the war on drugs. Did that work? The war on poverty, did that work? The war on anybody, has it ever worked? No. But love works. So the great book says, love thy enemy. If you think cancer is your enemy, love it. So I go, thank you, cancer. I love you. And people are going, my wife going, that's, that's really pushing it, Bill. I, that's really pushing it. I said, no. Because by me getting that cancer, and I've been fighting this cancer, in case you're wondering, since 1979, hundreds of surgeries, since 1979, I've been fighting it. And oh, it's only cancer. Well, you know what? Didn't that singer, Margarita guy, didn't he just die of cancer? Skin cancer? You can. It can be serious. So you get the big thing, you get rid of it. But I looked at cancer not as my enemy. When you engage somebody as an enemy, you don't win them over. They build resistance. They fight you back. Damn you, you know, and then you're just going to resist. But when you love your enemy, it's better to build a fence, right? Good to go. So I practiced that, and I loved the cancer. And then I looking for gratitude, and I said, thank you, God, for the gift of cancer. And people go, what gift? I'm here today as that gift because I'm telling you that cancer is not going to stop you. Cancer will inspire you. Cancer got me on the road to teach you these things. If I didn't have cancer, it's like, it's like me being a non-drinker. Don't drink, never drink. And I'm trying to tell you to, I'm going to tell you how to get rid of the drinking problem, that you got this bad drinking problem, and you're not going to listen to me. What do I know about drinking? You're going to join AA, when you got people that are real drunks, real drug addicts, that kicked it, and they know all the tricks of the trade, and, they'll be, and you're going to listen to them. You're not going to listen to a teetotaler. So in the same thought process, I'm coming to you as somebody that's been beat up, bruised, injured, diseased, 12 major heart attacks. I'm out there. And I'm surviving. And I'm 77 years old. And I'm still on the road kicking. Because I love me. And when I love me, I love you. And when I love you, I love God. I see no difference. No separation. That's what makes it work. So I go home for one of these, many of these surgeries. The first thing I do, I just sit. And I just say, I'll grab my nose, put my hands on it. And I just go, I love you. I really love you. I'm sorry I hurt you. But I love you. And I'm grateful for, for how, how the great service you gave me. It's always nice to have a good nose. Thank you. 
And uh, I'll do all I can to fix you. Thank you. I love you. And I love you too, cancer. Thank you for waking me up. Five minutes, two minutes, gets shorter all the time. When I stop, there is no pain. Not magic, the pain is gone. Seriously, you get your nose cut off and it's stitched up and burned, it's going to hurt for weeks. Mine, when I get home, as soon as I get home and sit down, within two, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes max, it's gone. So I'm practicing that technique. And then I just had just fixed my nose and the pain, and I was eating some seedless or pitless uh, dates. Well, you know, once in a while there's one in there that's not pitless. And I bite into it, and I break three molars, two up, one down. Not only did I break them, there were shards of the teeth jammed down into the gum itself. Sitting in the nerves, you could see it in a mirror. You could see it all separated and jagged in different angles. How many people have had tooth pain? Okay. How many people have had something in their nerve? Okay. So it's just the act of breathing air, just air coming in was painful. It was like, holy Toledo. And God help me, I got to drink some water, cold water, but he's like, whoo, you know. And I go, on, hmm, broken teeth. Okay. So I tried, it was during COVID. So I tried to get, I don't know if any of you tried to get a dentist appointment during COVID. Uh, if, you weren't a, if you weren't a patient, nobody was going to see you. They didn't want anybody new. Three days, I can't get nobody. So I got this. I haven't eaten in three days, I haven't slept. But I'm trusting something will happen. So I finally wake up, one guy at 5 o'clock in the morning, he had an emergency number, and I go, hey, look. He says, well, I can't, I'll come, I'll take a look at it, but I won't be able to see you for a long time, right? I said, okay. So I go in there, and he x-rays it, and he shows it to me, and he says, see this? He says, I'm thinking root canals, pull the teeth, uh, crown molars, something. I don't think I could fix it. It's probably going to end up root canals, and if I if I can't save it, I'm just going to pull them all. And I, and I said, well, okay, good doc. Do what you got to do. Well, okay. I said, when can you do it? It's like March, middle of March. And he goes, how about August 28th? <laughs> I'm going, really, doc? That's best you can do? I said, well, I'll put you on in case there's a cancellation. I said, okay. So I go back home, and I'm thinking, I can't wait. I have an opportunity. Here's a gift, a gift given to me to show that this healing technique works for broken teeth. Nobody challenges that before. I mean, you got broken teeth, broken. You can't fix broken teeth. Anybody will tell you that you can't fix broken teeth. Fact, right? Fact. But I'm going, I'm just a child inside. I don't have to believe that. I believe in the tooth fairy. I don't care. So I put my hands on my jaw and I just said, I love you. I love you. I love you. And I'm sorry I broke you. And I'm ever grateful for whatever you do to help me. Or not. It doesn't matter. I love you. And then I just forgot about it. And a couple minutes go by and I go, wait a minute. There is no more pain. So I went downstairs and had from the ice box, you know, ice water. Nothing. So then I thought, well, this, this really worked, right? So I added something to eat. No problem. So I called my friend in uh, London. And I didn't know at the time when I was talking to him on the phone because he looked kind of painful talking to me. I said, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but uh, I told him the story. And, and then he hung up on me. Then I found out a couple days later he calls me and said he had like six or eight real bad teeth that had to be pulled and he couldn't get into the dentist and he was in great pain. And listening to me, he practiced what I told him and his pain went down like 50% level or less. He was able to handle the weight. And I thought, wow, he got something there. So I posted a video talking about the process, right? It was right after going back to the dentist. I got a call from the dentist saying, we got a cancellation, can you come in? Okay. I come in there and he goes, make sure you bring money, at least 620, you know, bring in at least several hundred dollars as a down payment. But, but he's thinking thousands of dollars, right? I'm talking crown molars, you know, that'd be the least. 
you know, a root canal that, you know. But if he has to pull them all, I got three, three empty spots. And then you got to buy a teeth, right? So I go in there and he's, he's canceled every patient that morning for him and his partner, another dentist. And he says, there's two of us. We're going to do this. He shows me the x-ray. He says, yeah, yeah. If we try to fix them, we'll give you a, a root canal and maybe some, you know, we don't know. But we'll probably end up pulling them all. I said, do what you ever got to do, doc. <coughs> okay. So I sit down there, and he has a whole afternoon morning for me. And he's done in less than 50 minutes. And the other dentist didn't even get a chance to work on me. And I go, what's going on? He says, he says well, I'm sorry. I didn't give you a root canal. I said, well, that's okay, Doc. I forgive you. And, and, and he says, I, and I didn't have to pull any teeth. I said, that's okay. He says, I didn't put any crowns in. I said, well, that's okay. And he's thinking, oh, no, it's not, man. I'm not getting any of that money. That's what he's thinking. And uh, he says, but somehow, without doing any of that, your teeth are fixed. <laughs> okay. So I paid up and I left. And I thought, Wow. So I put that on the video. First month on the video, I had probably 60, 80, 100 people contact me saying, Reverend Bill, you healed me of my, you know, whatever it was, problem. And then I, each one of them I wrote back, no, Reverend Bill didn't do a darn thing. Reverend Bill just told you what he did. Your belief in what I told you healed you. Your belief in my words healed you. Your belief in the possibility healed you. That's why stories are important. If I just said, if I came to you, if you do this, you can fix broken teeth. That was the end of it. You didn't hear the story. You'd say, this guy's been smoking something funny, man. What's going on here, right? And uh, so, broken teeth. Healing pain. When I go get all these things done and my face, you saw my face, and then you come back a week and a half, 10 days later, and it looks like this. 11, 12 days ago, I was in an emergency. All this was a bloody mess. You got to walk your talk. My skin cancer really broke out so bad, and the face got totally infection. Here, to give you an idea how it was. This, my wife wouldn't take any pictures after this. This is the beginning. The face got infected. And I lost probably 14 ounces of my face fell off into the sink and into the shower. I couldn't go to work for seven months because at work, people, the boss told me, don't come and nobody wants to look at you. I mean, it was like, what, well, worse than Facebook to yell. So I was off from 19, July of 1998 till January something the following year for skin cancer. But skin cancer is nothing. Okay, why I was in that great pain, I hadn't quite learned how to handle it so well. And it was just, imagine showering and you're losing pieces of your face. I mean, it was really, for me, it was a challenge. I'm going, wow, you know, I looked like a monster. I went to the stores. I couldn't go to the store anymore because the store manager said, you know, Mr. McDonald, please don't come in. I go, what? Yeah, our customers are making them uncomfortable. I go, really? And I think it's, you know, because it was oozing and you know, it was terrible. Anyway, so I, I'd set up with a self-realization fellowship in Sacramento. I'd set up, started a prayer circle where I, I was, we were sending prayers to people and stuff. And I was volunteering and I was doing this and I was helping this person. I'm helping that person. So finally, one of the people there contacted me and said, hey, what is this? You help everybody else, and does it make you feel good? And I go, well, I guess it does. And then you do all this for this person, that person? And I go, yeah. What do you got against the rest of us doing something for you and us feeling good about it? How selfish are you? And I'm going, wow, I never thought about that. The idea is this, to get back to what we were talking about earlier about helping each other. I realized that if you only accept help, if you're always the helper, you're breaking the circle. This is a two-way thing. You're not always a teacher, you're a student too. 
your child will teach you something, especially when it comes to computers. Your grandson, can you tell me to figure this out? Right, the iPhone. So in this process of growing spiritually, realize this thing is always a two-way street. And some of the values and things that you learn the most is when you surrender and allow others to do something for you. Believe it or not, I didn't learn that till I was about 50 years old. And I'm going, wow, how selfish of me to only be one way. Because other people want to do things for me. Let them. It was a very humbling thing, but it was so enlightening at the same time. And I tell people, listen to your grandkids. Listen to the homeless person. Listen to your spouse. And for us husbands, damn, you better listen to your wife. You're in trouble. Right? We know we're wrong already. My wife is so psychic. How psychic is she, Bill? She knows I am wrong before I even open up and say what I'm going to say. She just knows it. It's just wisdom, that women's wisdom. So anyway, so when I come back, you guys will have some kind of notice or mailing list or something. Make sure you get on the mailing list. If, how many people are interested in emotional healing for a weekend, kind of like a in-house retreat thing? Okay. I want you to commit to being the student, but I want you also to commit to being a teacher because you may be paired off or something. I really want this to be a participating process. It's not always about Reverend Bill, even though part of my ego thinks so. <laughs> Just ask my wife. But it's not all of us. All of us. What makes Alcoholics Anonymous and Drugs Anonymous and all those things successful? Your 12-step program, what's the major thing? Becoming a sponsor. When you pass just getting helped and all of a sudden people are coming to you for help, what happens? You change by helping others. So nothing else today, think about this. In this healing process, you're healing yourself. When you heal yourself, actually you're healing the world around you. When you change your energy, no matter what level of frequency it may be, microscopic or huge, it doesn't matter. Incrementally, you're changing the world. If you don't like what's going on there, well, Doug, stop watching cable news. You want to fight with your friends because you don't agree who they vote for? Who cares? Get off your horse. It doesn't matter. They're all bad. You get that attitude, you say, hey, okay, yeah, my guy's terrible, your guy's terrible. End of story. Let's move on. It doesn't matter. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Not an idle thing. But listen to that. As you love yourself. That's the part we're missing. My God, love you. You are one of the most beautiful spiritual beings that ever walked. You walk with God. You are God. You are loved. You are love. You're capable of giving it. See that part of yourselves. Forgive yourself. Okay, I've been goofing around. All right, I forgive myself. Let's move on. Some of you still believe those words in your head from your parents. You're stupid. You're never going to amount to nothing. You're ugly. You're, you're never going to get a career, a job. You're never going to hold that marriage. You're never, all these things, right? You're stupid. How many, how many times your parents ever said you're stupid? A couple of us, right? When you believe that, you've been sold a big lie. And you've crippled yourself. Stop believing that. What other people think about you is none of the, your business. They don't care. Think anything you think of me. Don't lie to yourself. Be truthful and honest with yourself. Love you and it doesn't matter. Okay? All right. Let's go back to healing. Got everybody back now. Nobody's hiding. I've also found with healing that absolute surrender, and I mean absolute surrender, is the foundation. In other words, you got cancer. 
you got bad relationships. You spiritually got issues. Whatever it is. I give up. I surrender. All right, let's find a solution. Don't keep digging the hole. Sometimes you just got to go, you know, I need help. To go back to my story. You need help. There's nobody here, not even Reverend Bill, that can do this alone. I think I can sometimes. I think I can. Oh, that was a train. I'm sorry. But <laughs> nobody is capable. Nobody hears unto themselves everything, but together we are all. Earlier in this, I was talking to somebody in here. Earlier in this thing, I said the most important thing is when you die, it's not about who loves you. Because, you know, you die. You wrote the song, Margaritaville, right? Everybody loves you, right? Nobody knows your personal life. I don't know what kind of guy the guy was, you know, but everybody loves this guy. It's not about who loves you. Who did you love when you were alive? And if you loved your enemies, great blessings. Anybody can love a child. Anybody can love their spouse. Anybody can love their partner. Anybody can love me. I'm easy. Okay, it's a couple snickles. But loving somebody that doesn't return it, loving somebody that despises you, does terrible things to you, doesn't mean that you approve it, doesn't mean you hang around and take the abuse, doesn't mean that you like them, but you don't hate them. You just send them love. You don't go up to them and say, I'm sorry, you know, I forgive you for all this nasty stuff you did. That's your ego. Who cares? But it's not about what they think. In your heart, you go, you know what? I'm not a prisoner anymore. I'm letting it go. What you did to me in childhood or what you did to me in the first marriage or the second marriage or whatever, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that my heart opens the door for you. And you're, you're loved. Because you're part of this whole team. So how many people here, just curiosity, how many people believe in the possibility of reincarnation? Possibility. Okay. <laughs> Think about this. It's been said by some masters and people that we never meet a stranger. That all these people coming into your life have been in your life. Maybe they skip a generation or something, but They've been in your life, and you're thrown back into your life. So you got to ask yourself, geez, I'm having problems with this person. If I'm going to get bumped into them again, it'd be a darn good thing if I just get rid of this problem now. Resolve it. Let it go. Because what attracts people together? Two things, love and hate. You hate somebody, they're probably going to come back into your life. You love somebody, they're probably going to come back into your life. So who do you want back into your life? Those you love. So if you love everybody, not a problem. Bury it. Move on. Bury it. Okay. I'm going to give you some examples of other ways to use this healing technique. The hands-on. When I was in Washington, D.C., number of years, when my daughter was in Sacramento State College, I think she was a freshman, sophomore, junior or something. And she was up at Lake Tahoe, a place called Squaw Valley where they had the Olympics, which is now called Politically Correct Paradise or something. It's got a new name. It's can't call it Squaw Valley anymore. So I'm in Politically Incorrect. So whatever it is now, let's forgive me. So she's up there and her and her friends, college friends, decide to have a little party. They go out at night on the slopes where they had the downhill skiing. And with short skis, they go down in the darkness uh, at Squaw Valley. And, uh, of course, she crashes. She blows out her knee. And there's a snowstorm up there. And she's snowed in. And she cries and everything. And Anyway, she finally, a few days later, she gets to Kaiser. Kaiser looks at her knee, and it's all swollen up. And you can't operate or fix it when it's swollen. So they tell her, we're going to put her a soft cast on there, one of those Velcro things. And... When it goes down, we're gonna, we, have to, we have to operate. You got all kinds of broken, the kneecap's broken, the, the, the knee's broken. So she calls me up. She says, Dad, uh, I, I need you to handle this. Uh, Kaiser wants to operate on my knee. And she tells me a story. I says, No. She goes, Dad, what do you mean, no? 
I said, no, I'm going to be home. There's nothing wrong with your knee. Dad, they got x-rays. You know, she goes, this whole thing. I said, no, I'll be home in a couple weeks. Boom. So I finally get home. She's walking around, crutches, two crutches. She's got this cast on. I bring her into my meditation room. I tell her to take the cast off, lay down, put the cat crutches over there. And then I use this healing technique where I'm actually, you know, I'm rubbing her hands together to get some electricity in there. And I go over, and then I grab her knee, and then I do this focused energy charging, and then I put dramatic tension right in her kneecap, and it just, you know, tightened up, tightened up. And then three minutes of that, and I just keel over. I'm sweating. I'm tired. I just, I just fall down. And then I get up, and I tell her, get up and walk. Get out of here. She got up, and she walked. There's nothing wrong. So the next week, she goes to the doctor. <laughs> Kaiser, and they hear the story, and she walks in, like, where's your crutches? Where's your... And, 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 she, and she tells them what happens. She says, oh, no, no, we don't believe in miracles. Uh, obviously, there was nothing wrong with it. Who told you? And she says, well, you did. You looked at the x-rays, and you said I needed surgery. Well, somebody made an error because you can't just go from that damage to this. And then he looks at the x-ray, and he kind of didn't say nothing. And then she left, right? So she comes home and says, Dad, you didn't do nothing. There was nothing wrong with my knee. I said, okay. So the next day, she falls down the stairs, two-story stairs. It blows it out. It's worse than it was the first time. Boom. You put your hand on there, and it's just rattling. You can feel all the pieces in her, in her knee. And I said, you ready for this for a second time? <laughs> so she goes in. We do the same thing, except this time... <laughs> This time I plant a seed. I go, I said, it's going to be 95% fixed. 5% is going to take six months to fix. You're going to feel just a little gimp. But you're going to walk. That's exactly what happened. Because she believed it wholeheartedly the first time, and then doubt was put into her mind. I mean, I didn't ask for God to push her down the stairs, but life is what it is. And then she blew it out again and had to have it done again. And just for testing her mind, I tell her it's only 95% healed. This is exactly what happened. So why am I telling you that? Because I'm telling you that the placebo effect is something that's real. Don't laugh at it. Oh, they give me a sugar pill and they got cured. Well, it worked. They got cured. End of story. If somebody's working on you, I don't care if you think they're if you think they're doing something really good and it works, it worked. Stop second-guessing it. It worked. That's good. It doesn't matter. So when you go someplace, you got to ask yourself, well, what's the placebo effect? It's what you believe. So if I tell you, take these pills and then nothing but sugar, and you're going to be okay, and you believe me because you trust me, what's going to happen? You're going to be okay. It's the power of the mind. It's not the sugar. It's not even the drugs they give you. If you believe in Western medicine, or you believe in a, a voodoo, or you believe in, you know, whatever, whatever thing you come, if you believe in it, it works. Acupuncture works if you believe in it. It works well. It's nice if there's a little science behind it, but ultimately, it is you who are dictating your own healing. I didn't do anything for my daughter. She believed in me. She's seen all the other stuff I've done. She was easy. I'm telling you, believe in you. I believe in you. The potential healer is in each one of you. If you choose to heal yourself, and if it's just to speed up the healing process, now, for those over the years that have witnessed my surgeries and they seem terrible where I'm banned on Facebook and then I come back a week or two later and I'm like this, I'm seriously like this, you got to say, well, I want what he's drinking, right? <laughs> what was that stupid movie, Sleeping in Seattle? I want what she has, right? So it works. It works. It's so simply stupid and childlike, people don't want to believe what I'm telling them. It's all you. Now, I've, there's some people that will deny it because they know some of the stuff I've done, but ultimately it's, for example, 
I had a neighbor and she had cancer and she fell into a coma. It was just before Christmas. Her son was expecting a baby, so it was going to be a first grandchild. And yet she was going to be, she was in a coma dying in the hospital. Uh, I pulled my minister card and got in the ICU. As I'm her minister, I get in there. And uh, she's laying there. And I just put my hands on her forehead, on top of her head. And I used my technique on that. Eyes open up, look. Next day she's released to go back home. She still had terminal cancer. She was still in a wheelchair. She was still, I didn't change her death date. But her only desire was to spend Christmas and New Year's with her grandchild. That's exactly what happened. And as soon as New Year's expired, she left. I went to see my mother-in-law. She had a stroke in the hospital on Easter Sunday in the Catholic Church. And she collapsed and she never recovered. She never, she was in a coma. Went to see her. We had to make a decision on what to do. Nine days she'd been laying there put my hands on her forehead, did my process. She sat up in the bed, opened her eyes, eyeballed me, eyeball to eyeball, and it was like, okay, do it. You know, don't, don't keep me going. Just do it. And she put her head back down. When I was in India, I was stuck in a traffic jam at the Ganges River going in back down to Delhi. And uh, a bus hit the truck that was ahead of us, jackknifed the truck. The truck was pulling a trailer. On top of this trailer was this old guy, really grungy old guy, that was riding on top of uh, some sugar beets real up high. Me and him had been eyeballing each other and just stuck in traffic. Where he was just been staring at me, and I was staring at him. I was feeling some kind of connection. It was weird. And then all of a sudden it hits. He flies off the top of this trailer, lands Boom, back of his head on this asphalt. You could hear it everywhere. And I go, I run out to him. He's, he's unconscious. He's not breathing. There's no pulse. He's basically dead. That's the way it appeared. But he was so grungy looking, and the area was known for AIDS. I didn't want to give mouth to mouth, and so I apologized to him for that. And I took a bottle of water and I washed his face, his lips, and I cuddled him. And I told him that God loved him. And he was loved. I gave him a little shot of energy. <laughs> Eyes opened up. He was good to go. So, somebody's unconscious. Well, you didn't do anything. They didn't have to know. When you're unconscious... You still hear. You can be in a coma. So no, Reverend Bill still didn't do that because people go, well, see, you did that. And those people, no, no, because they were in an unconscious state, but there was no resistance to my voice. There was no resistance to what I was telling them. There was no resistance to my energy. Think about that one for a while. Because when people are in comas and they're dying, People would stand around talking about them like they're not there. I'm going to guarantee it, they are, and they hear you. So be loving in your thoughts and words. Okay. All right. Let's get a chair up here. Is that chair empty? <laughs> so what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of demonstrate this technique on somebody. And I want you to watch it. And then I'm going to have people come up. And I'm going to do absolutely everybody here that wants it, hands on. It will take us a while. I don't need a break once in a while. And uh, those people later on that want to learn how to do this to other people, see my good friends here, give them your name. Because we will do a session of that or so on. Because there's more to doing that. You need a little bit of wisdom and guidance on that because we just don't want people out there going to think they're saving the world. But for your children, for your spouse, for your pets, I don't think God's going to be too upset with you if you try to give them a little love and help them. Okay? 
you can interfere. But interfering with people's karma is a big thing. Okay, who is it that had to go early? That was, why don't you just sit there and relax? And I notice her shoes are off. My shoes are off. I'm barefoot. When you're transmitting energy, and that's what we're talking about, think of electrical current. Anybody know anything about electricity? Now you've got to ground it. Being barefoot helps grounding this current. So I'm visualizing energy coming from the cosmos, from heaven, from whatever, the light. Visualize it any way you want. But it's lightning energy coming into you through your top of your head. Call it crown, crown chakra if it makes you feel better. Call it the top of your head if that makes you feel better. But this energy is going to imagine it. You imagine it. What are you talking about? When you imagine things and you visualize things, your mind creates a reality at another level. That's why athletes, like for the Olympics, they were taught uh, many, many Olympics ago, they gave these guys uh, sessions where they were visualizing their success during gymnastics, uh, running, all these things. They were visualizing themselves doing the pole vaulting. I know it sounds crazy, but they actually had coaches teaching people in the Olympic caliber area how to visualize their what they were going to do before they did it. So they couldn't run the pole vault all day long, but in their mind, they could. And they visualized themselves going over and correcting their posture and all that. Healing, meditation, there is power in visualization. You know, the mind doesn't separate reality from imagination very well. It kind of kind of blends together. That's why it's important that you don't keep telling your hurtful stories to yourself over and over or to others. Because every time you do, you're reliving it. It's, your mind thinks it's real again. Well, I got beat up or raped or something. Well, you know what? Every time you talk about it, you just done it to yourself again. It's a deeper groove. You inflicted more pain on yourself. Somebody's harmed you. Don't allow them to keep harming you. Tell them, hey, I don't need that anymore. You're just harming yourself. So at some point, you got to go, I don't need that. All right. So that's why I talk about visualization. Okay. You're sitting in a wheelchair, you're sitting in a hospital bed, you're sitting in a home, wherever you're at. What would life be like for you healthy? Can you visualize healthy to you? Can you and that may just mean another level above what you're at now. And if you're powerful enough, it may mean a greater level than that. But can you visual, visualize yourself healthy? If you can't visualize it, then you can't really believe it. So start with the imagination. Like, well, what would it feel like if I could actually run again? What would it feel like if my back didn't hurt? Now I could actually bend. I could actually walk. I could do these things. Visualize. Visualization is materialization is manifesting. It's all the same. So we're going to manifest energy. Why don't you hold your glasses here? We're going to manifest energy going to the top of her head, through her spine, visualizing that light lighting up her chakras going down, and then it's going to bounce out through the antenna, her fingers, her hands. The energy is going to come out there. So it's like, I'm lifting this heavy weight, but you don't have to. It's just like, I, I'm just tensing up, bringing it down. I'm imagining this energy coming down and coming out my fingertips. <clears throat> if I imagine it good enough, it becomes reality. Now, if she is doing the same thing I'm doing, I'm visualizing this going through her, I'm visualizing it coming to me, and she's helping me by visualizing it coming in, and she's visualizing that energy going to her, then we're working together. She believes, I believe. Okay? And then she's going to surrender because she's not going to dictate to God, God, here's what I need. Do this, do that. 
She's going to say, God, whatever I need, I'm here for you. Spiritual awakening, spiritual healing, emotional healing, physical. What is it that you want to gift me? Give it to God. Don't say, well, God, I need this. I need... Don't. I never asked God to take away pain. I've never asked God to take away pain. I've never prayed to God to take away my cancer. Could you believe that in all those years? I never uttered a prayer to God to say, take it away. Because I'm telling God, oh, I don't like that gift you gave me. You can give me a good job, money, retirement, good friends, but I don't want that cancer. How dare I? I accepted all the other gifts. Whatever's bothering you, whatever ailment you got, whatever disease and injury you have, don't ask God to take it away. Only thing you should be asking from God is, give me the courage, the faith, the tools I need to handle whatever's happening. Don't take away the problem. Just allow me to handle this. Sometimes that's all you need is to be able to handle it. Because you don't know what lessons you're learning from what you're going through. So don't get in that debate. Don't demand from God like in Santa Claus. Hey, God, hey, I, I need a new Mercedes Benz. Uh, you know, I need a new house. I need a new job. And I'm going to put all this stuff on my refrigerator with pictures of it. And I'm going to visualize and materialize and manifest all that stuff. Crap. I'm sorry it works, but why are you doing it? If you want to visualize and manifest something, manifest love. Manifest forgiveness. The rest of the stuff is it's going to be thrown away someday. The car ain't going to last. The house may burn down or the floor will blow away. So it doesn't matter. Those are things. Manifest love. Manifest forgiveness. That's what she meant. Okay, so she's going to visualize this. It's coming. It's, a, it's, it's like one of these info commercials where they keep going on. You're watching it on YouTube. Okay, when's it going to get to the punchline? What's, what's this special secret ingredient, right? They keep going on and on and on. So now you invested all this time. What is it? Okay, it's very simple. So we're going to do this together. She's barefoot. She's grounded. I'm grounded. I rub my hands together. And if, you, if those that have taken recharging lessons or if you go into self-realization fellowship meetings or Ananda or any of those groups, you'll see these yoga groups when they're getting ready to send out healing to others. They, they do this. Why? Because it creates friction, it creates electricity, it creates energy. Some people will do this. It creates energy, you know, energy, you know, all that stuff. It's, there's groups in China that do that, this kind of stuff. All that stuff generates whatever feels comfortable for you. This will generate energy and stuff. I, I do this. Sometimes I, I do this. Sometimes I do this. Whatever you feel good at. So my hands are charged. That's my antenna. I'm already visualizing. Now here's where the caution comes. For her and for me. What is the danger I'm talking about? For those that are in the healing business, you know what I'm talking about. You're opening the door. I could get what she has. Right? You are the healer. I don't care if it's your dog you're doing, whatever you're doing. You need to shield yourself. You need to visualize white light around you before you start and ask for guidance. You know, God knows what's right, so you're just, you're just, you're just a tool. So you pray to God inside. Bless me. Bless my hands. Protect me. Protect both of us because you're opening spiritual doors. So you just want to be protected. That's all. Simple. Whatever words come to your mind. A lot of you are in the healing business already. You've got your own routine. Do it. Whatever it takes to protect you. All right. Now, I do it slightly different for everybody I do. I'm going to show you the basic. Sometimes you'll see me do this, and then I'll maybe do touch the spiritual eye. Maybe I'll touch a part of the body. Maybe I'll whisper something to somebody. Okay, that, it's just, I follow my whatever intuitive thing, I just do it. Don't ask me why. But this could be basic. All right. Rub that together.
she'll sit there for a little bit, but she's not weak or something. So basically, I just told her she's loved, she's forgiven, she is love. Just saying you're loved is not enough. You have to know you are the source. You are love. Half of you in this audience right now or more, maybe all of you, you have a hard time believing that you are a powerful, loving, spiritual antenna for the world. That love emanates from you. And you can change this world, you can change everything about this world just by creating greater love within yourself. And by you loving, how you see the world will change. Your reality will be a little bit different. Because you will... We had that discussion last night talking about seeing garbage in India. Uh, I'll repeat that story because I think it's a good one. I was in Calcutta, one of my many trips to India, and I'm standing there and there's this guy just takes a dump on the street, on the sidewalk, and everybody walks by and I'm going, man, that's just that's terrible. And I'm just focusing on that and I'm seeing that and the garbage piled up and down the street there's a, a lot and it's got garbage piled up and you know, it was just terrible. And there was this holy man watching me and he goes, he goes, I don't see any of that. See what? He says, you see the garbage. I go, yeah. I mean, there's, there's, you know, this. And he goes, he says, see that lot down there? I said, the one with the garbage? He says, I don't see any garbage. He says, there's a wild jasmine growing there. And I see that growing between the garbage. And I smell the jasmine. That's where my focus is at. So I'm telling you, stop watching cable television news. Okay? Pull the plug. Stop seeing the garbage. It's everywhere. Once you see lying politicians, you'll always see lying politicians. Once, once you see shootings, you're going to always see shootings. Whatever you focus on, you will see more of. Don't focus on it. If you've got to do something to help change the world, those situations, great. Do your piece. But you know what? Don't spend the rest of your life worrying about things. It ain't never coming. To, hey, what's the little town you're in, Corrales? When's the last time you guys had a major shootout there? When's the last time you had gangsters erupting, you know, in the war? Okay, I rest my case. They're not coming to your doorstep. But you spend all this time watching it on television happen to everybody else around the world. Apparently there was some big earthquake someplace. Morocco. Some, where? Morocco. Morocco. A lot of people got killed. That's all I saw in the headline. That was enough for me. I didn't want to dig any deeper, but send prayers to them. But it's like, if you focus on the tragedies, if you focus on that, think about this. People, I go to a place I give a talk about love. Okay, you can go sit down there. Thank you. Look at that. She's walking. It's, it's a miracle. <laughs> anyway. Sorry. Uh, wherever, wherever I was going with that. But we owe it to the world just to be the best us we can be. That's a hard job. Nobody else could be you or you or you. But I'll tell you what, you're the best you that you can be. That's all you can do. I said, well, what's my purpose? You know, I'm not here. I'm, I'm not going to be the president. I'm not going to get a Nobel Prize. Uh, I don't have a gold record. I, I don't get a Super Bowl ring. I mean, well, who am I? What am I doing? If you're a parent, bless your heart. If you're a faithful spouse, bless your heart. If you're a teacher of children, bless your heart. If you're a truck driver bringing food into the city, bless your heart. If you're helping in the food kitchen, bless your heart. Whatever you are doing, wherever you are doing it, God has put you there. Your roots are in that service. Give. What's our purpose of life, Reverend Bill? Why, why are we here? To love and to serve. Well, how? What? It doesn't matter. What talents do you have? If you go to the restaurant and Somebody really gives you good service, you give them a great tip, they smile, you smile, everybody's happy. You see a homeless person, you smile, 
set them up silent prayer or maybe an outline prayer or something. Whatever you see, whatever you do, adds another layer of love. It doesn't take great events. You know, wow, I got to wait till I can save the world. No. It's like that stupid story, if I hear it one more time, and I'll tell it one more time, but I hate the story about the starfish, right? Kid walking down the beach and, you know, the grand, grandfather with the grandson, the kid's got all these starfish washed up on the beach. They're all dying in the sun, right? And the kid is picking one up and throwing it in the ocean. Kept, the kid, father, grandpa says, that ain't going to do nothing. And he says, well, it's going to save that one. And it's going to save that one. So no effort is too small. Start with the obvious. Those that you live with. Wow. We ignore them. Spouses take each other for example. Don't do that. If you knew tomorrow you weren't going to get up, that tonight was it, how would you act? How would you go to bed? What would you say to each other? Every time your child goes out the door, is that the last time you're going to see him? Do you want to be mad at him for something? So always live like it's the last day. Even if it takes 100 years and you make the right decisions. Okay, that's the basics. All right, we're going to do, if you don't want to be done, then don't come up. Just wave me off. Let's just start right here. Sit there. We'll do less talking. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to ask you guys to do, if you feel, feel so inclined, when I rub my hands together, you rub your hands together, kind of point your hands towards that person. And if you could chant Om or say a silent prayer for them or give them love, then just go along with me as I do this. So I'm not doing this. You know, Om is beautiful. If, if it's too tiring for you, then just give me hands. If that's too tiring, then just give love from your heart. Okay, I'm rub my hands together. And sometimes I rub my hands together and I just, I just kind of clap. I don't know why. It just, it just feels like it captures the energy. So I'm, ca- I'm grabbing the front here and the back. forgiven. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are loved. Go forth. Blessings and peace. God bless you. Take your hat off and glasses off. forgiven. You are loved. Go in peace and health. Bless you. yourself and know you're forgiven. Go forth in health, peace, and blessings. forgiven. You are worthy of all the love of the world. Believe in yourself. Forgive yourself. Go forth in peace and health.
love and all. You are forgiven. You are worthy of all the love in the world. God loves you. Bob G loves you. Go forth in health. Oh, I just did you already. Yeah. I should want a second. Oh, no, I want you over here. Okay. Oh, yeah. Old guys forget these things. Born to love and know. You are loved. You are love. You are forgiven. Blessings, peace, and love to you. Go forth in health. He loves you. You are forgiven. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Go forth in health and peace. Amen. Greatly loved, you are forgiven. Go in peace and love. Heal thyself. Amen. Jesus loves you. Love yourself and know that you are one with him. Go in peace and harmony and love. Focus, focus there, focus there. You are loved more than you'll ever know. You are forgiven. Go forth in health and peace. You are blessed. Amen.
Lord, and they'll never know. You will forgive them. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Know that you're already worthy of everything. Go forth in health and peace. Blessings. Focus right there. Focus. Focus on spiritual life. Know that you are loved more than you'll ever know. Know that Babaji loves you. Know that Jesus loves you. Love yourself. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Blessings. Peace. Focus on your spiritual life. Focus here. Focus. Know that you are loved. Know that Babaji loves you. Know that Jesus loves you. You are loved beyond compare. You are forgiven. Go in peace and health. You are blessed. Jesus loves you. Babaji loves you. Love yourself. Know that you are made of love. You are love. And you are loved. Go forth. You are blessed. Bless your health. Bless your life. Amen. Focus on your spiritual eye. Focus here. Focus. Babaji loves you. Jesus loves you. You are loved more than you'll ever know. Love yourself. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. You are enough. Blessings. Peace. Focus on the spiritual life. Focus, 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 focus. You are loved. Jesus loves you. Babaji loves you. You are forgiven. You are loved. You are loved. Blessings, peace, and good health.
you are greatly loved. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are loved more than you will ever know. With blessings and peace and love to you and good health. Jesus loves you. You are loved more than you will ever know. You are forgiven. Forgive yourself. Love yourself. Go forth with the blessings of God. Focus on the spiritual eye. Focus on the light here. Focus on love. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Know that Babaji loves you. Know that Jesus loves you. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Bless you. Go forth in health and peace. Focus on the light. Focus here. Know that you are loved more than you will ever realize. Know that you are forgiven. Know that you are worthy of all the love in the world. Of God, Christ, go with you in peace and love. Jesus loves you. Bob, he loves you. Forgive yourself. Love yourself. Go back with blessings. Know that you are loved. You are healed. You are forgiven. Everybody turn here. I want you to give a real strong, strong ohm. Really visualize massive amount of light coming here, please. I need help.
Lord's Lord, you'll never know. God loves you. You are blessed. Love yourself. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Go in peace. Go in love. Amen. forgiven. Jesus loves you. Why would she love you? You love more than you will ever know. Believe in love. Become love. Give love. Be love. Blessings to you. Amen. blessed. You are forgiven. Jesus loves you. Babaji loves you. Love yourself. Know that you have to do nothing to be worthy of it. Just accept the love that is around you. Go forth. You are healed as your faith heals you. Amen. Jesus loves you. Love you loves you. God loves you. Love yourself. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Go forth. Blessings and peace. You will be healed according to your own faith. Amen. Focus here. See the light, feel the light, feel the energy. You will receive the healing according to your faith. You are loved more than you'll ever know. Babaji loves you. Lord Shiva loves you. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Go forth. Blessings of love, peace. To you. Amen. Shanti. Focus on your spiritual eye. Know that you are loved. Know that you are blessed with love. Know that you are forgiven. 
Forgive yourself. Love yourself. Jesus loves you. Why would he love you? You are blessed with the healing according to your own faith. Go with my blessings today. on your third eye. Focus on the light here. Know that you're loved. Know that you're forgiven. Know that Babaji, Jesus, love you. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. You'll be healed according to your own faith. Blessings and peace. Amen. here the whole time. The light is going to come in. You are loved more than you will ever know. You are forgiven. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Know that you are truly blessed. You are a child of God. You are God. You are love. Give love. Become love. You will be healed according to your own faith. Amen. Blessings. Go forth. Focus here. Feel the light and the love. You are loved more than you will ever know. You are forgiven. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Jesus loves you. Babaji loves you. You will be healed according to your own faith. Blessings and peace be upon you. Amen. Focus on the light here. You are loved more than you will ever know. You are forgiven. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Know that Jesus. Babaji and the great ones love you. You'll be healed according to your own faith and your own belief. Blessings and peace upon you. Go forth in love. Amen.
focus here. Focus on the light. Know that you are loved more than you'll ever realize. Jesus loves you. Why would you love you? Love yourself. Forgive yourself. Be at peace. You will be healed according to your own faith and belief. Now before you go, put both hands on. Is this the bad knee? Yeah. Put your hand, back, hands on there. Okay. Give me a loud ohm. Focus light right here. The healing's going to come from within. You are loved. Oh, she loves you. Jesus loves you. Love yourself. Forgive yourself. You love more than you will ever realize. You will be healed according to your own faith and belief. Go forth with love in your heart and share it with others. Be at peace. Amen. yourself, forgive yourself, become love, give love, be love. You will be healed according to your own faith and belief. Amen. Now stay here. Just stand up. Stay here. I'm going to have you do something. Stand over here. When I finish this last one, I'm going to demonstrate one of you healing, if somebody else wants to do this afterwards, heal a friend or somebody you're acquainted with, come on up. I want to have people get, people that really want to do this, I want to have a practice shot at it. I've already done this with both you and Santa Rosa, I believe. Yeah. Okay. beyond knowing you were forgiven more than you'll ever know love yourself forgive yourself be at peace Baba she loves you Lord Shiva loves you blessings and peace you will be healed according to your own faith amen peace All right. now stay here all right now, if you're doing this for your partner, your friend, family member, have a seat. You just seen what I've been doing. You had a chance to try this before. Let's chant at home. Let's let her do this. Anybody else who want to do this as a pair, let me know. This is your opportunity for a little hands-on. Okay.
to switch roles. We have anybody else here practicing healing arts of any kind? You two go next. Let's, uh, let's bring another chair up here. You can have you two and so another pair. Okay, you guys bring your chair over here. And why don't you sit first? Who else wants to pair up? Ah, two volunteers right here. <laughs> Jim, go on up. Jim, can let her do it to you. That sounds terrible. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so basically you know what you're doing. Front, the back, you can be up on the crown a little bit if you want. You can, if you feel it, you can, you can do a little pressure here on spiritual light at the end or at the beginning to kind of get them to focus on that, okay? Same thing here, front and the back. If you want to tap his spiritual eye or touch at the beginning or the end, if you feel he needs a little spiritual light there, that works too. All right, go ahead. Switch, switch, if you wish. Okay, we're going to do a group thing. Can you roll down here? Can you move them down here? Let's stay there. It's going to be part of this. And two of you. And you. And you. I want all you guys surround him. Arm, shoulder, head, somebody maybe on the knees. Come on down here. Clear a path. We're going to be all around him in a circle. Any direction you want to face that's comfortable is okay. Okay. Come on back here. I want everybody to direct your energy here. Okay? All right. Oh.
Father, can all of you, all of you give him a blessing? Everybody give him a blessing. Silently or vocally, doesn't matter. Bless him. Thank all of you for helping. Amen.